Good morning and welcome to Moments with Melinda. I am your host, Melinda Moulton. And today I am so pleased and honored to have Neil Offen with me today. Neil, how are you doing? I am doing really well, Melinda. Good to spend some time with you. I'm so glad to see you today and to have you on my show. Let me tell my viewers a little bit about, about you. Neil Offen has spent his career as a reporter, editor, blogger, humor columnist, and author. He has a new book, Building a Better Boomer, which offers laugh out loud advice for the generation caught between chat GPT and Betamax VHS. Best-selling author Stephen Petros says, this is a book for all boomers and those who are for and love them. So Neil, that's your newest book and we're gonna get into that in a minute. But was that about, was that correct about you? Is there anything that I missed? Um, you know, when I was um, 14, I was a lifeguard. Um, I was probably a terrible lifeguard. Um, my first job was, um, which my father got for me, um, was selling Eskimo pie ice creams on the beach in the middle of the summer, wearing a large um, freezer package on my back. So everything since then has been much better. Oh my God. Well, we're going to, we're going to get into this, man. We are going to get into this. Um, so I want you to tell us, I'm going to set my timer right here. Um, I want you to tell us, um, oh, I just wanted to tell my viewers that, look, it is not often that I have repeat guests in the same year. I don't think I've ever done it. Um, and Neil, I think you're my first. I interviewed- I am honored. I interviewed first a while back with Mitch Stevens to talk about your website, writing about our generation. And here you are again, and let me tell you why. Let me tell my viewers why. Because I want my guests to know more about you. And that's why you've come back, I think within the last six months, as my sole guest on my TV show. So let's start at the beginning. Tell us about where you were born and about your childhood growing up. And we just heard about your... Um, your lifeguard experience. So tell us about your growing up, your childhood. Okay, well, I was, I'm a New Yorker, though I um, haven't lived in New York since 1976. I was one of those New Yorkers who said, I'm never going to leave. And the world ended at the Hudson River and all of that. Um, I grew up in the Bronx, um, walking distance, a good long walk from Yankee Stadium which meant um, my career goal was to play center field for the Yankees. Um, that did not happen. You know, I, you probably know that. Um, I really lived uh, until um, um, I graduated from college, uh, from City College of New York, the uh, proletarian Harvard, it was known at the time, or at least to us, it was known um, as that. Um, and... Um, in 1976, uh, my wife and I, we had gotten married. We met in college. We had gotten married in 1970. So I have been married, I think, 343 years is the technical number. And um, it's really hard to get a card, you know, an appropriate card for that. Um, so we, um, we left in 1976 to move to France. Um, this is more than my childhood. This is now my adulthood. Is that okay? okay that's okay. You keep going. Okay. So we, we left, um, and um, this was after, let me back up a little. I had been a sports reporter. Um, I had been a sports reporter for what was then the largest afternoon newspaper uh, in the country, the, um, the New York Post. This was a pre-Rupert Murdoch New York Post. It was very different. I'd had a really good sports section. And I covered everything from ice hockey to baseball to the New York Mets in 1969 when they shocked the world and won the World Series. Um, and I left that job. Um, and then we left um, the country because we didn't have kids. We didn't have a car, we didn't own a house, and we thought foolishly in the era before the internet that we could live abroad and make it work. Um, we thought we would live there for two years. We lived uh, 
in total for almost a decade, uh, first in Paris, then in the south of France, in a tiny little village where um, there were 400 or so people, and we were the three Americans because our son was born in Paris. Uh, we, My wife gave birth in French, which is a completely different experience. Um, I'm condensing an entire lifetime now into, uh, you know, a minute and a half. Uh, in 1985, we moved back to the States. Uh, we moved back um, not to New York, which was the only place that either my wife or I knew, but we moved back to, um, we wanted a small town, but we wanted some place where we could get good wine and cheese. So we moved um to the university town of Chapel Hill in North Carolina. And if you had asked me 35 or so years ago, if I would have spent most of my lifetime, most of my adult lifetime in North Carolina, I would have said, are you out of your mind? But it's a really nice place to, to live. It's a good place where we are in Chapel Hill to be from somewhere else because so many other people are from somewhere else. Um, it's big enough and small enough. And so that's the, the personal side. Professionally, I've um, been a journalist all my life. I started in high school. I um, was uh, one of the editors of my college paper. I worked at the, the New York Post as a sports reporter and columnist, and then wrote for a lot of different magazines for everything from Good Housekeeping to Esquire to Sport Magazine um, and to Reader's Digest, um, and then um, have been writing books for the last 40 years or so, everything from a book about the training of a young doctor to the... Um, to a, a book about sports fans, um, to book about theater, uh, community theater. So after we came back to the States, I worked um, for a time at the local radio station as their news director. I worked at the local newspaper as Metro editor. I worked at a local, um, well, actually a national um, theater publication um, as their managing editor. Um, clearly, I can't hold a job, which is why I keep switching all these jobs. And technically, and now I'm finally winding up, Melinda, and I'm sure you didn't expect all of this. Technically, uh, in over the last 10 years or so, I have been retired, which, as you well know, means that I'm busier than I've ever been. Exactly. You are. I mean, well, we all, it is, we're repurposed. We didn't, we never retire. We don't retire until we're in the ground. We are repurposed. And we, we are, I'm, I'm not, I don't even know about the re I'm, I'm writing more than I have in a long time. I write for writing about our generation. Uh, as you mentioned, I write for medium. I write for a local digital paper called the local reporter. I'm really busy. You well, know, that's great. Yeah. I love being busy. Everybody wants a piece of you, Neil. Now, listen, I want to know who had the greatest impact on your writing career and your capacity. Who, Where did you get your capacity for humor and your ability to look at life in such an easy and connecting way? Dostoevsky. <laughs> yeah. No, clear, clearly it was either Dostoevsky or, um, or Tolstoy. Um, you know, that's, that's an interesting thing. Um, as a New Yorker, you know, I've been gone from New York since 1976. And what is that? Almost 50 years. I think, did I do the math right there? I think so. Um, but I think people who grow up, particularly in ethnic neighborhoods in New York, they develop a kind of humor to deal with, you know, all of the stuff that New York forces on you, that it demands of you. And I've always talked funny. I've always thought funny. I've always, I think, been quick-witted. And I think my writing has always reflected that, that, that I've wanted, I've wanted to amuse people. Um, one of the jobs that I did mention 
uh, earlier in my extended rant was that I wrote a funny comic strip. I didn't do the I didn't do the drawing because I can't draw, um, but a, a very talented artist did that, and I wrote the jokes. Um, and writing um, humorously has come fairly naturally. I think I was probably um, probably a little bit. Um, impacted by um not by writer as well um sj perlman a famous writer of the 20s and 30s for the new yorker um a little bit of groucho marx in the in the marx brothers movies i think probably um had an influence on me um and basically if you've written you know good stuff i've realized you've probably stolen it from somewhere And and you know you take it and you adapt a little bit. So when, so you got your start also as a limerick writer, I think in high school. Can you offer us a limerick? Um, I I've tried limericks, but most of my limericks ended with words that we're not supposed to say on your show. I think like Nantucket. Okay, so now Neil, you were once lauded as that guy by the New York Times and hailed as him by NPR, and you were named Un Homme Très Etrange, I don't think I pronounced that correctly at all. Uh, you were close. By, by the French government. You were an award-winning and important person, Neil. You just are. And yet you were one of the most humble and deeply lighthearted people I know. How do you stay so humble? Um, I, are you kidding? I have a family. How, how else, you know, I have, a, I have a wife. I have two kids. They, they keep me humble. They know, um, you know, I sometimes, when I've told a story for the 738th time to friends about the time that when we were in Italy, I did such and such. I'll tell you that story now, Melinda. So the first time I was ever in Italy, we had taken the train down from Geneva to Venice. You get out on the train station in Venice and you see there's the Grand Canal, and you go, oh my gosh, there's the Grand Canal. What, you know, to use a, a Vermont expression, what chutzpah they had to build a city on water. So my wife and I, we quickly found a cheap hotel. We wanted to go explore. The way you get around in, in Venice is by um, little boats that are like buses called Vaporettos. We walk up to the ticket booth and I, in my terrible Italian, I say, due per San Marco, because we want to go to the, the center of town, the Piazza San Marco. And the guy starts saying something to me in Italian. I have no idea what he's saying. And he keeps, you know, talking. And I say, due San Marco. And he starts really shouting loudly at me and people are starting to gather and he's he's now almost screaming finally he gets out of the ticker taker booth grabs me by the arm and pushes us in the direction of one of the vaporettos we get on the boat and i say to my wife can you believe it we've been here all of a half an hour and and i look at my hand and it's full of wet paint and it occurs to me the guy was saying idiot Take your hand off the rail. It's wet paint. <laughs> anyway, what was the question, Melinda? And then we're moving on. That is hysterical. That is beautiful. It was about how do you stay so humble because you are humble. Oh, now, I, no, I, I stay humble because I'm sometimes the idiot who put his hand on the rail with wet paint. Well, and you and you have a beautiful way of laughing at yourself and others that makes us that makes us all feel loved. Now, now we're going to talk about something a little bit more serious. If you'll share this with my viewers, because I think it's important. You just recently had a brush with death, Neil, and shortly thereafter, you ran a five k race. Tremendous resiliency and smart moves, keeping the grim reaper at bay. Uh, would you share with your viewer, viewers your story? I think it's an important one. Okay. Well, on New Year's weekend. Um, Fortunately, we were home. We were not in a small village in southern France or on an island in Greece. Um, I got um, all of the absolutely traditional, classic, well-described symptoms of a heart attack. 
which is to say crushing, chest pain, nausea, um, sweating. Um, I thought it was ignoring all that. I thought it was instead um, uh, indigestion, um, heartburn. Um, my wife, um, who is a far smarter woman than I am, uh, wanted to call 911. I said, no, 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 it'll go away. It didn't go away. Um, finally, she insisted, um, I'm going to drive you to the hospital. Fortunately, we live a very short distance from the emergency room of a major hospital. Um, it was the New Year's weekend. There was no traffic. We made every light. Uh, when I got there, um, and this is a, a piece of advice, if you're ever at the emergency room and don't want to be in the waiting room for three hours while everyone else gets taken, when they ask what brings you here, tell them the, th the three key words, severe chest pains. They took me immediately into the cath lab. They did an EKG. Um, they put in a stent. I was essentially dead. Um, the cardiologist later told me that um, I they had to shock my heart five times. They had to um, uh, do CPR several times. He said that they thought they were going to lose me. Uh, instead, um, they put a stent in. I was in the hospital for four nights rather than a month. Um, the doctor later, later told me that had we lived five minutes further away from the hospital, I probably don't make it. So I am, and now I'm just summing up, I am an extraordinarily lucky, fortunate person who has recovered remarkably well. Um, I'm back to running. Uh, I don't run as fast and I don't run as long, but I did do a 5K with my daughter on Memorial Day weekend, four and a half months after being in the hospital, um, came in second in my age group. There were only three people in my age group, but please don't tell your listeners that. Wow. I mean, you and Mitch, Mitch is doing triathlons. Mitch is, Mitch is incredible. Yeah. Right. yeah. You know. But he's but he's much younger. He's three years younger. He is three years younger. But listen, bravo to you, and we're so glad that you that you beat the Green Reaper, and you're here with us today, and and that your health is is steady and healthy, Neil. So speaking about Mitch Stevens, um, this website writing about our generation that you and Mitch, uh, who is another notable writer, um, have created. You have you have lots of incredible contributors including two Vermonters, which is myself and John Kalaki. Most of my viewers probably know John. So talk to us about how that came to be and how you, Mitch, how you and Mitch decided to develop this. Mitch and I have known each other since we met in Aix-en-Provence in the early 1980s. Um, they were among the very, Mitch was on sabbatical and he and his family were there. They had kids about the age of our son. Uh, and we became friends and have stayed friends through 40 years. Um, after Mitch retired from teaching journalism, where he had been at NYU for three decades, we started to throw some ideas around of things we wanted to do. And both of us being writers, things we wanted to say and things we thought friends of ours and people in our age group like you and John would also want to say and over, I guess, a six or eight month period, we slowly developed. We had to, the, the hard part was the technical website stuff itself. And, you know, Mitch is better than I am. And it's a sobering thought, as we say, that he's our 75 year old IT guy. Um, but we but we figured it out. Um, and um, we've been having a ball with it. It's It's been great to get a wide variety of people um, writing, um, interesting people like your, yourself. Um, it's given us, when we have an idea, you know, two minutes before we started, it occurred to me there was something that I wanted to write about. So uh, because I forget a lot of things, I actually wrote it down and I'll try to get to it in the next day or two. 
And it's a great thing to have a place where I know I can publish it and to have a place where other people are um, have similar interests and similar life experiences and different life experiences. One of, one of the things we just did on the website is ranking all the presidents of our lifetime, going all the way back for my, for my age to Harry Truman. And it was fascinating because all of them, all the presidencies were marred by something. And so you know who came out number one? Oh. Well, you may know who came out last. So yeah, we've had 14 presidents. I wonder who came out. Top right. Top but no, number one by process of elimination, and this surprised me, was Lyndon Johnson. Wow. Who, yeah. who we, you know, who I reviled in the 60s and 70s, um, you know, and, you know, marched against uh, against everything he did. But on balance, the civil rights legislation, the voter rights legislation, Medicaid, Medicare, that was all him. It's all him. Yeah. Uh, yes. I Well, that doesn't surprise me at all now. I mean, right now we're like, oh, Dick Cheney, you go guy. You know, I mean, yeah, th things are <laughs> things have changed from when we were 17, 18, 19 yeah. in our early 20s fighting against the Vietnam War. We have changed and we've things things change we, we, we have a different perspective we have a different so so i want to i wanted i wanted to bring this up to you i had a thought about to my viewers go to www.writingaboutourgeneration.com and you'll get to the website mit um neil i had a thought you know you could have the writers on on their phones record their pieces and you could have a little piece at the at the top which could have them reading their piece for people who don't want to read it um, which might be really cool. Or, you know, we could even think about moving into like some kind of a podca podcast thing. But, you know, they they do that on on some, some you know, articles where they'll have the, the writer. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that we may hire you as our IT girl. Well, let me, let me, let me just send, next time I write for you, which I'm going to write one about hair, because today I, I got Neil on my, on my Zoom for this interview and I went, Oh my heavens. I mean, my hair, well, you know, it's 74. I put on a hat. I thought maybe I can, you know, maybe I can improve my look with a hat, but you know, our hair, my hair, I don't know. I love your hair, but so I'm going to write an essay about hair in your seventies and not the hair that we grew up with. Right. Like, not, 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 not the hair not, of the 1970s. Not the hair of the 1970s, but the hair of the seven of the seventies. So, okay. So that's a thought. And I will do that next time I write this essay. So now I want you to talk a little bit about your book uh, that you just wrote called Building, there it is. There it is. Building a Better Boomer. And um, and which which I encourage all my guests uh, to get on. You get it at your favorite bookstore, uh, but you also have to give a copy to your children and to those who love us, who love their their older parents. Um, so, Neil, it's it's hysterical. It's a great book. Tell us a little bit about what inspired you to write it? So I had been writing for um, local newspapers, um, funny columns, humorous columns for some time um, about lots of different things. But I realized after a period that there was a theme to many of the columns. And that theme was, what was it like to be getting older, to be a baby boomer when the world is changing, when you're changing? when you're adapting to technology, when you're adapting to retirement, when you're adapting to health issues. And I realized that um, at first, you know, I could take a few of the columns and put them together and it would make a book. But then I realized, no, let me rework all of this. Let me, you know, give advice because you know, we see this all the time in newspapers and magazines and TV shows and videos and on social media, all this advice about, you know, get more sleep and eat better and, you know, make sure you exercise 25 minutes a day, you know, 332 days a year. And all of this is true. All of this we is stuff we know. I wanted to have fun with it. 
And I think I think what the book does, um, you know, it, it talks about, you know, preventing falls because, you know, in, you know, 98% of falls, you end up on the ground, which is not a good thing. Um, you know, the idea is um, maybe to give a little bit of advice, but also to take a little bit of that advice and laugh at it. So, Neil, what, could you read a couple minutes of your book? Sure. Oh, I just happen to have it here. <laughs> that would be great. Thank you. Let me, this is a. a often reading about it, reading from his book, Building a Better Boomer. <laughs> so this chapter or small chapter that I'm going to read is about retirement. Since many of us, like you, Melinda, like me, are of retirement age, and if I can think. So, what makes a good retirement? Well, having money helps, of course. Research has shown that it's much better than not having money. 78% of retired people with money say they wish they had 78% more money. Yes, it's important to have saved for many years and who have avoided the 12 notorious retirement blunders and the seven infamous retirement mistakes. But money isn't everything, although it's a big help when you're buying stuff. To have a successful, fulfilling retirement, you can't just lie in bed all day counting your money, no matter how attractive that is and how good a mattress you have. Sometimes you'll have to get up and go to the bathroom. So if you want to succeed in retirement, as I have, you must embrace your new status and make it meaningful. Here's how. Learn a new skill. Learning new skills keeps a retired mind sharp. You could take up masonry or learn how to speak Swahili or how to sneer like the French. Personally, I have recently been, been practicing introductory intracranial neurosurgery. It's far more interesting than masonry, more fun than sneering like the French, and it has kept my mind extremely sharp, except when by mistake I take the anesthesia myself. Learning a new skill will improve your self-confidence, help you forge new social connections, and keep those neurons firing, even though they may give you the occasional migraine and cause the sprinklers in your house to activate. Research has shown that being a lifelong learner can help ward off memory loss and improve cognitive abilities. And as we age, we increasingly need those cognitive abilities if the internet is down and we can Google things. I have one more, if you um, have a moment, Melinda. Another thing to do in retirement, give back to your community. Over the years, your community has given you a lot. Now's the time to return the favor. So get out there and clean some streets, even if you do blow the leaves onto your neighbor's lawn. Frisk, frisk some dangerous looking individuals who are just lurking around the area, even if they say they are delivering the mail. Direct traffic on the nearest four-lane highway, particularly at night when motorists don't see as well and could use the help. When you're the one driving, instead of pulling over when you hear an ambulance sirens behind you, plow straight ahead, leading the ambulance to where it's going. They may thank you later or have you arrested. Beautiful. Thank you, Neil. So that's fabulous. So again, you know, uh, your book is Building a Better Boomer. You can get it at your local bookstore. And I suggest you share it with your children and those you love. It's a beautiful book and it's funny and it's uplifting. And it doesn't take us too seriously, does it, Neil? Now, one thing I want to I ask you as we're coming to the end of our show is what words of wisdom would you give and offer our humanity uh, today, Neil? What words of wisdom? That's that's a... Uh... You know, the words, I'll tell you the first thing that comes to mind, Melinda, because I had a near-death experience recently, um, a friend of mine um, talked to me after I got out of the hospital, and I was talking to her about how fortunate I was. 
And she said she has a little sign by her bedside that she sees. It's the first thing she sees every morning before she sees the alarm clock or can find her glasses or whatever. It says, greet each day with gratitude. And um, it's a cliche. It's a um, it's obvious, but it's also really good advice. Thank you. Thank you to her for sharing that with us. I agree with you. So, Neil, I want to thank you so much for your lightness of being in a very serious world and your ability to lift up spirits that have fallen, your willingness to make us laugh and find joy in your moments and in our moments, and your kind and yet powerful spirit. You are a gift, Neil, and I'm honored to call you my friend. I'm so glad that you got to share time with us. Can you just, before we say goodbye, just let us know what, what's your next project? What are you working on? Um, I've been writing a series of um, articles for medium.com, a digital publication on um, making things easy, sort of a little bit like um, the dummies series, you know, carpentry for dummies. This is sleep made easy and eating made easy and showering made easy. And I'm just starting to think that if I can keep going, there may be a book there. So where do we find this this site? www. It's, it's medium.com. Medium.com. And, and search for my name. And I also want to encourage to Neil often, and I also want to encourage my viewers to check out writingaboutourgeneration.com, uh, this fabulous website. And uh, that Neil and Mitch Stevens have put together. So Neil, thank you so much for being on my show. You're such a delight. And I'm so glad to share you with my viewers. And um, and I wish you a beautiful day, my friend. I wish you a beautiful day as well, Melinda. This has been so much fun. You're so much fun to spend time with. And we're so glad that through writing about our generation, we've met. And um, it's really nice. Thank you. Delight. It's been a delight. Thank you. And to my viewers, I will see you soon. Bye-bye.